Hey YouTube, Mr. Terry back here once again for another History Teacher Reacts video as I continue my quest for historical knowledge. Alright, um, today we are continuing on with Extra History's series on Otto von Bismarck. Um, this video, uh, I'll be watching episodes 3 and 4 of what I believe is a 6 part series. Um, I did a video previously uh, over videos 1 and 2 um, from them, so if you haven't seen those, um, you should probably check those out first, then come back to here. Um, keep an eye out for the final video of the series that I'll have out uh, shortly. All right, um, with that, just a reminder, this video series was actually selected by our Patreons. Um, Right now, um, all patrons, um, regardless of their pledge level, get to participate in a weekly poll where I put some of the videos I'm interested uh, in and they vote and they kind of get fast track to being on this channel. So if that's something um, you might be interested in, there'll be a link down below to uh, join the Patreon. It's a way you can support this channel. All right, before we begin to, I want to plug the original creators here. If you like the original videos, be sure to go down to the description and there will be a link to the original videos so you can give them a like and subscribe and your support for the great uh, content creators out there making awesome history stuff out here on YouTube. All right, then. I think um, we're ready to go. Okay, this is episode three um, out of Von Bismarck. Iron and Blood is the title of this episode. So let's dive right in. Moved from radical to pragmatic, he was at last offered a position in which he would shine. The position of envoy, diplomat, and dealmaker. <laughs> Yeah, he, going back to the, the the first two parts we watched, he had an interesting rise to power that seemed kind of interesting to me because it doesn't. Se it seems like in a way he's going counter of kind of the trend that Prussia is is going in and much of Europe is going in um, here in the 1800s. The, uh, he is somebody that would be more of a classical conservative in this in this uh, in this era. He was uh, much more supportive of kind of the traditional system that had been around at a time when. Um, what you might consider a new, the new liberalism was um, starting to gain popularity, and some of the ar uh, stronger arguments for creating um, like constitutional monarchies and that sort of thing. While he was somebody that was more supportive of the original system, uh, supporting the emperor and uh, monarchy, just in empire or emperors and, and and kind of monarchies in general. But he, it seemed like, had found a way to like still stay kind of relevant in the face of these changes while um, being able to kind of be with the conservative group, but then also still not seem harsh enough, maybe from the more liberal side. Um, and he's kind of, yeah, made his way kind of um, very uh, subtly kind of up the, up the ranks here um, and kind of be, you know, um, rubbing shoulders with the kind of the who's who of the Prussian monarchy and the Prussian people here. So I'm, like, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, interested to see how this is going to continue up. Bismarck's tutelage in the diplomatic craft was swift. As he wrote to his wife, I am making rapid progress in the art of using many words to say nothing at all. <laughs> Should, some people say, I'd say, shouldn't that just be the, the tagline of just politicians, people that are, you know, critical politicians, right? Making rapid progress in the art of using many words to say nothing at all. A lot of times people say that's that's how, like, just politicians sound, you know what I mean? Um, and, and if people buy that, oh, they must be, they're speaking a lot and they're using a lot of words, they must know what they're saying and there must be a point and there must be a plan. <laughs> I like that he's just buying into that, like, stereotype pretty much he wrote this from frankfurt he had been assigned as the prussian envoy to the diet of the german confederation that being the body that was supposed to figure out how the whole mess of 39 german states were to work together but yeah. working with the austrians was the furthest thing from bismarck's mind so if you hadn't seen the first um couple couple episodes the big kind of topic uh, uh, right now is the possibility of unifying the states here in central um central europe so with germany um potentially austria prussia and that's kind of been on the docket although it's not getting it, it seems like the support it was right now and uh, it looks like he's somebody that probably thinks maybe that he can he can do that um rather than having all again all these small kingdoms they feel that a unified kind of central europe here would be um really advantageous, you know, as, as a, a power here in Europe. To work together. 
But working with the Austrians was the furthest thing from Bismarck's mind. He was there to assert that Prussia was Austria's equal. And he did this with aplomb by lighting a cigar. See, Don't smoking make him feel in small, the assembly like was a privilege okay. granted only to Austrians. But when the Austrian representative <laughs> wow, sitting really? next to him took out a cigar and began to smoke, Bismarck cracked out one of his own and, saying nothing, lit up. The press loved it. His enemies <laughs> loved it too. When he returned to Berlin, one of them claimed publicly that the only thing Bismarck actually accomplished in Frankfurt was burning a cigar. <laughs> and, of course, because old habits die hard, one thing led to another and the ever-diplomatic Bismarck found himself once again on the field of honor, trading shots more, with a fellow Prussian over a cigar. If you also didn't remember in the first one, um, he was known for having duels, you know, in his younger years and now in his adult, you know, um, more uh, advanced adult age, they're still doing that. We talked about in the first video how what if that was still a thing like you could legally like have these duels and the sort of results would be respected. Um, it's amazing and <laughs> to have that like between politicians or something like that or just regular people. It's like out in the Capitol, if you have two politicians and they're arguing, they're like, all right, let's go duel. And they go down the steps of the Capitol, go out and I'll go to the lawn of the White House. And then they pull out a couple dueling revolvers and end it right there. Are burnt to snub the Habsburgs, but his time in Frankfurt taught him one thing. If the Prussians were ever to carry the same weight amongst the German states as their much larger rival, they would need allies. So he began to court what he saw as the two most valuable possible confederates for Prussia, Russia and France. But then, in October okay. of 1857, the king of states, Prussia probably. suffered a stroke. The king's brother, named Wilhelm, because of course he was, why should a family have to come up with more than one name, took over the leadership. <laughs> this Wilhelm, though, considered Bismarck as nothing more than a petulant schoolboy. His words, Ooh. Bismarck had a plan, though. Bismarck Savage. always has a plan. He would counter this opinion in a most un-Bismarckian, and therefore most Bismarckian, way. <laughs> he delivered to the prince a 92-page treatise detailing exactly how Prussia could abide by the letter of the agreement they'd signed that founded the German Confederation, while simultaneously aligning the other German states against Austria. Unfortunately, mm. Wilhelm thought that was stupid. Bismarck was promptly assigned as the Prussian envoy to the Tsar. Because, you know, I guess if you want to get rid of somebody in 18th century Europe, you just him. put him in St. Petersburg. Yeah, send him to Russia. Moscow. And there he would sit on ice until 1862. These were some of the bleakest years of his life. Mm. He was cut out of state affairs, he fell ill, he nearly lost the use of his leg, and even withdrew himself from Russian society as his ability to serve as a diplomat was hindered by the fact that everybody knew he was there because his sovereign didn't want him in Prussia. But, at last, a strange Nobody letter came. Him. One saying that he should return to Berlin with haste. When he got there, against all odds, he was asked to serve as the head of government. You might reasonably ask, yeah. why? why? Why would the king who had so long snubbed him ask him to run the state? How could he go from a remote diplomatic posting to the head of domestic affairs? Well, because nobody else wanted the job. At least, nobody else the king thought wouldn't plunge the country into civil war. You see, for a year, the Liberal Party had refused to grant funds for the army. And if you know anything about Prussia, you know Voltaire's old adage. Where some states have an army, the Prussian army has a state. Meaning that not funding the army had brought them to the brink of constitutional crisis. And the king's hmm. closest advisor's best suggestion was to have the army overthrow the Democratic Assembly and then figure it out from there. <laughs> which was basically a hundred percent guaranteed to start a civil war. Yeah. So the king figured, call in Bismarck, I guess. If he succeeds, fabulous. If he fails, then we'll just throw him on. Remember how in other times in, in his kind of um, positions of government, they listened to him in more of the chaotic times, but then when it was time for peace, they didn't want him. Um, they, they didn't want him almost kind of, it brings it in my mind, like, um, uh, like Winston Churchill, right? They, they, when it was peace before the war, they highly rejected him. When there was war, they, uh, brought him in, right. Uh, to basically take things over for, um, the British in world war two. And then basically when the war was over to win the peace, they get rid of him. So it's like, you know, timing is so important for how he's going to be treated here. At least that's how it's Mark, I guess. If he succeeds, fabulous. If he fails, then we'll just throw him under the anachronistic bus. 
As the announcement went out, no one in the wider world of Europe really thought he had a chance. Neither did many in Prussia. For two weeks, Bismarck had to scramble to pull together a cabinet, because nobody thought his government would last. Simultaneously, he also had to bolster the spirit of the king, who, in his dejection, was continuously on the brink of giving in. And in the midst of all of this, almost as an offhand remark to those who were debating funding the army, he said the words that would define him and define the age. Oh, yeah? The great questions of the day will be decided not by speeches and majority votes, that was the great mistake of 1848 and 1849, but by iron and blood. Mm, but in the midst yep. of all the chaos, Bismarck had a plan. Bismarck always has always. a plan. If he couldn't get to the Landstag to do what he wanted, well, then he would just have to do what he wanted anyway. Yeah, the iron and blood uh, kind of phrase. That's kind of like his the thing he's famous for, right? Iron and blood. And now you can see a little bit about more about where that context comes from. Um, but it, it's a back. It seems like it's a backhanded slap against democracy. It's like real stuff, real progress. I don't know. Real action happens. Yeah, through iron and blood. Um, so yeah. Way. You see, the king and the parliament were supposed to agree on any new budget before the government could collect taxes on that budget and do with them whatever they wanted. Everyone else took this Seems to mean fair. that the government could not collect taxes without parliament's approval. But Bismarck had other ideas. See, the constitution didn't really spell out exactly what the government was supposed to do if the king and the parliament couldn't agree on a budget. So Bismarck just said, Find the gray area. well, we don't have a new budget. Guess we have to keep collecting taxes based on last year's budget. And so sent out the king's tax collectors to do what they did best. For nearly half a decade, the government would continue to collect the 1861 budget, and the king would have a stream of revenue without asking parliament for a thing. Mm. With that settled, Otto now had the prestige and the freedom to turn to what he saw as his larger project, positioning Prussia to be the preeminent power in Germany when the German states finally unified. He moved rapidly. First, he checked in with France to see if they would stay neutral, or perhaps even join Prussia if an armed conflict broke out between them and Austria. Uh. Then he wooed the smaller German states to begin voting with Prussia, even as he was baffling the Austrians with an alternating volley of threats and lofty promises about how much they could accomplish together. But even as he was holding his own in German affairs, his zeal abroad nearly cost him his ministry. A rebellion had broken out in Poland, and the Russians were eager to quell it, already sending in troops. Bismarck immediately dispatched Prussian divisions to the Polish border, and sent a note to Russia basically saying, Hey guys, we can totally help you with that. Soon, protests over this action broke out from the other major European powers, yeah, with sure. France, Great Britain, and Austria all condemning Berlin. Many thought that Bismarck would have to resign over this, but the king, the very same one who had exiled him to Russia before, refused his resignation. Soon, <laughs> Europe's ire turned from Berlin to St. Petersburg, and while the matter would blow over in time, to the Russians, this unification of the European powers against them brought to mind the recent and disastrous Crimean War, and mm. in doing so, reminded them just why having an ally in Prussia might be valuable. But just as this affair was being put behind him, his great project was again in jeopardy. The Emperor right. of Austria had invited the Prussian king to a Congress of Princes to discuss the matter of German unification. Bismarck at once saw that the Austrians had stacked the deck, and any vote at such a conference would go in their favor. But he also knew that he wouldn't be able to convince the king that an invitation from other princes was a trap. So he took a different approach. The king was never the most secure of people, so Bismarck convinced him that the invitation was an insult, and that <laughs> it should have been sent to him with much more formality. There's there's so much political crafting happening here by by um, Otto here. It's pretty incredible the way he, he plays everybody, right? Both friend and foe. He just he plays them and gets them to do, like just to get him to, to think the way that he wants to. Um, he, he really is showing just expert, I don't know, uh, uh, politicking here. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. So the king declined to go. But then, days later, the king of Saxony rode up, bearing another invitation imploring the prince to come. 
Now so he has been formally right asked to attend by 30 princes with a king as the message bearer. There would be no convincing good old Wilhelm that this was a slight. Instead, in a meeting full of shouting, imploring, and not a little sobbing on both sides, Bismarck convinced the king that he would be giving up the independence of the Prussian army if he agreed to anything at this conference. And so, with Bismarck ripping off the door handle on the way out, once again, the king declined to attend. With that, the course was set. The initial threats were in check. Now, at last, Bismarck could truly begin his project of iron and blood. Oh. Good. It's good to see a more background about the whole iron and blood thing. But yeah, just like I was saying a second ago, the um, is just is is method of politics um, is, uh, is kind of been so you know, hit or miss, but, but successful and, um, uh, everything's just so crafted, you know, the way he's trying to approach things. So, all right, I just want to jump right into, um, episode four. Cause, uh, want to see as he's really going to get, get, uh, get his hands dirty here, um, with the unification project. So let's see what's going on. All right. So that was, yeah. So three, um, we're hopping to episode four. looks like this one is called the iron chancellor. Okay. Let's do it. It is go time in Bismarck land. Yep. You are off. Bismarck had a list and he was checking it twice. Action item number one on that list, steamroll some Danes. <laughs> 16 okay. years prior in 1848, Prussia had invaded Denmark with the hopes of annexing the largely German speaking duchies of Schleswig and Holstein. Mm -hmm. But the threat of international intervention had sent them packing. Nope. Now no, no. it was time for revenge, or at least a very pragmatic seizure of territory. You see, the Danish king had just cacked it, and as basically always happens Bad when timing. a European king checks out, his death left everybody scrambling over the succession. And in this case, that scramble was played out between one staunchly Danish branch of the family and one sympathetic to the Germans. When the Danish group won out, they decided that it was high time to rule Schleswig and Holstein directly, to finally incorporate them into the Kingdom of Denmark, not to leave them as semi-independent duchies with their own weird rules and privileges. This violated the, the treaty team. the Danes had signed with the Prussians, though, and gave Bismarck his chance. Mm. But it also made things tricky. After all, if Bismarck used ideas of liberating the oppressed and defending smaller nations' rights to justify that's, invading Schleswig that's not Holstein, what he's about, he'd though. have to find a really good reason for sticking around to occupy those places himself, instead of just leaving again. He had been setting up these dominoes for a while, though. There would be... Can't, you can't have your cake and eat it too, right? With, with the way that he's going to be appro he's approaching this Danish issue, so interested to see just again what, what's going to happen here. No repeat of the last time when they had to flee due to other powers coming in on the side of the Danes. He had already secured the friendship of the Russians, and made right. vague promises to the French that they might see some territory out of the whole deal if Prussia was allowed to absorb Schleswig and Holstein. He did a lot, didn't they say in the first... I remember in those first couple videos how he would just make promises after promises, just big ones to everybody. And that's a lot of pressure um, to, to do that and try to make do on them. He kind of, yeah, he had done that like crazy. Now you're doing it with like, not just these, you know, individuals he's growing up with or whatever, but now it's like powerful nations, Russia and France, um, well, specifically with France here, uh, making these promises. Uh, you can't, you know... Um, can't uh you know uh, uh default on this right that, that could be catastrophic so let's see eventually you got to pay up right they might see some territory out of the whole deal if prussia was allowed to absorb schleswig and holstein and without russia or france britain would protest but they'd never actually go to war on the <laughs> danish side he had also uh, suffered don't do in it. Austria, convincing we'll help them, them that they were all on the same side germans defending germans and all that he even convinced them to be allies and contribute a horde of troops to the effort. And this is key. Not only did he need Austrian troops to secure a quick victory, but it would also make them complicit. If, after they yeah. won, he said that Prussia was going to take territory, the Austrians wouldn't walk away without their share, which not only meant that European public opinion wouldn't turn against Prussia, but also meant that he wouldn't lose the moral high ground in the German Confederacy. And his plan worked perfectly. 
The combined Prussian-Austrian forces rapidly overran Denmark. The Danes had to grant the independence of Schleswig and Holstein. Bismarck made some ludicrous demands, and the Austrians, not wanting to be left out, eventually caved to a compromise that left Bismarck exactly where he actually wanted to be. Prussia would keep Schleswig, the Austrians would get Holstein, and he would get a small pile of other minor concessions to boot. But Bismarck was always a man hmm. of large appetites. He didn't come all this way to only get Schleswig. And so, part two of the plan commenced. Operation Make Fun of Austrian Incompetence. He played up everything that went wrong in Holstein, and talked openly about it being a breeding ground for revolutionaries. His sound and fury brought the two nations to the brink the of war. Backstabber, but both of their huh? monarchs wanted to avoid such a conflict between brothers. Wilhelm accepted the possibility of war, but forbade Bismarck from explicitly goading the Austrians anymore. Yeah. But Bismarck's work on that front was already done. He had a backup plan in case war didn't come. Bismarck always had a backup plan, but he spent most Not of his time plan, trying to shore up alliances to make sure that Prussia was ready for the fight his king sort of didn't want. First, the Italians. Victor Emmanuel, the man trying to unify Italy, desperately wanted to take over Venice, which yeah, it's, was... It's like unification time in uh, in, in the mid-19th century, right? Um, there's just been a history of all of these small states, and a lot of people realize how some of these modern countries, like they like Germany and Italy, for example, um, did, have not really been around that long, and not in the way that we look at them today, right? So... Um, yeah, this unification has been such a big deal because it's also this idea, like going back to the Napoleonic era that um, just completely sent France to um, being this powerful state and the, the, the um, imbalance um, that eventually got created where you have these big states in Europe and then you have all these little states. And that was really shown, um, uh, that, that uh, kind of imbalance was really shown in the Napoleonic years. And now, in, here in the 1900s, they feel, you know, kind of this, this uh, people are more, it looks like, willing at this moment to unify, or at least take it more seriously um, for leaders to try to unify so you can be uh, stronger to be able to compete more and, cre and, and create a uh, more balance of power. Well, the man trying to unify Italy desperately wanted to take over Venice, which was in Austrian hands. I mean, how can you have an Italy with no Venice? But he was mm. never going to have the strength to fight Fort Austria City. alone. And so Bismarck seized on this, getting him to agree that if Prussia and Austria went to war, the newly formed Italian kingdom would join in for only the small, small price of one Venice, which Bismarck didn't really want anyway. Next, the French. Friend of my friend, right? While not publicly successful in securing the French as allies, Bismarck was dealing enemy with Napoleon III here, a man too clever for his own good by <laughs> half. Napoleon III, who saw himself as the equal of his famous uncle, but really, really wasn't, no, took the only no, no. course of action that would get in him name nothing. only. He wouldn't support Prussia, but he wouldn't support Austria either. This hmm. was just fine by Bismarck. Stay Finally, out of it. Bismarck kept pressure on Austria, having Prussian officials meet with Romanians and Magyars, Czechs and Serbs, any ethnic minority within the Austrian Empire, all in order to make it look like he was building allies and raising legions. That's, all, that's always been um, a real issue for the Austro, um, for Austria, is their diversity. You look on a map and you just see this big swath of land, but fail to realize how ethnically diverse um eastern europe is right they're already uh, naming off uh people there okay magyars serbs slavs i mean there's so many different uh groups there and that always been of course difficult for them um to be able to yeah to, to unify that way of revolutionaries ready to revolt the moment the austrians went to war but bismarck's plans were interrupted by one thing he did not factor in as he walked down the great boulevard Unter den Linden, two shots broke Ooh. the quiet. He whirls. A young man stands before him, revolver in hand. The 51-year-old Bismarck grabs him. Three more shots ring out as they grapple. Finally, soldiers run up and subdue the young man. As the assassin is hauled off, they check Bismarck for wounds. One finds a hole in his coat and follows it to find a hole in his waistcoat which, with some trepidation, he follows to find a hole in Bismarck's shirt. All five shots had hit, but every one of them had either only grazed him or bounced off of his ribs. 
in a moment that history doesn't record but I think we all know happened, Bismarck simply nodded to the soldier, said, Iron Chancellor, <laughs> put on shades, and walked away. <laughs> Refusing to let one measly assassination attempt get in the way of a good war, He's I am invincible. went right back to work getting the German-speaking world to tear itself apart. And as rumors swirled, the Austrians felt they had to make a move. So they called the Pan-German Diet in Frankfurt to decide the issue of Schleswig and Holstein. The Diet moved against Prussia, but this played right into Bismarck's hand. The moment the Diet came to their decision, the Prussian representative read a statement that Bismarck had prepared for just such a moment, okay. declaring the Diet invalid and the German Confederation dissolved. Now it would be war. It would be the northern German states and Prussia against the southern German states and the Austrian Empire. Hundreds of thousands of men were mustered. It could have been a long war, but now the king had in his service a general as capable on the battlefield as Bismarck was in the conference room, General Moltke. The uncle of the General Moltke who will so disastrously lead the German forces into the First World War, this Moltke could not have been more different from mm. his nephew. He was one of the first to see that the modern rifle had made the idea of the frontal charge obsolete. He grasped the importance of Thinking railroads ahead. for mobilization and yep. realized that modern armies were too big to be commanded by one man, that plans should be flexible and subordinates should be allowed to take initiative within them. This this may seem a lot of this seem like common sense, but um battle strategies and tactics were so stiff in much of uh, uh, European history like it was just like it has to be done this way and this is the way you do it and of course this is I mean this is a new era right we're, we're here uh, in um, mid 1800s amongst industrialization and technological advancement and uh, those that were obviously thinking a little bit forward here and not being so stubborn to older ways are going to find themselves you know on top that plans should be flexible and subordinates should be allowed to take initiative within them. It was this Moltke who famously said, plans never survive contact with the enemy. Moltke mm. led a lightning war, crushing the once great Austrian empire within weeks. And now where Bismarck had once had to work so hard to get the king to go to war, their success had been so great that he had to work equally hard to get the king to stop. Bismarck realized that they could only push so far before the other great powers stepped in and all of the work that he had done would be undone. More still, he believed that once he had eclipsed them, he might need the Austrians to serve as a balance against one of the other great powers, so he must not impose on them a peace that would leave them hating Prussia. So Bismarck called in his erstwhile enemy, the Crown Prince, the same Frederick Wilhelm who he had so unsuccessfully tried to put on the throne as a that, toddler, yeah. and put him to work reigning in his father. Fritz, a lover of peace despite being an excellent military commander, convinced the king to accept the deal that Bismarck had on the table. Prussia would take over most of northern Germany. The German Confederation as a body would be disbanded. Their Italian allies would get Venice, and Austria would forever be banned from any pan-German parliament or mm. from meddling in German affairs. Oh, and weirdly, Liechtenstein became an independent country, so that also. Ooh. All in all, things were looking up for Bismarck's grand project of uniting all of Germany under Prussian rule. There just loomed one more obstacle, one great nation that, although neutral so far, would oppose any further increase in German unity and strength. There was the problem yeah. of France. Yeah, if you, I mean, if you're France, you don't like this i mean how could you i mean yeah you're kind of neutral but you don't want to see this powerful growing state bordering near you right france has been territorially it's just so dominant um for uh many years right because all these other they were basically surrounded by all of these little kingdoms right so yeah they're they're obviously going to be nervous um but haven't really put their foot down mostly been thinking about themselves as you saw bismarck to i guess try to keep the the french off their back was um trying to give them stuff right to to kind of make them happy there so um yeah you're gonna i think this growing if you want to call it german nationalism or whatever and the french nationalism um is probably gonna have to come to a head here soon i mean we know it does in, in world war one but we're not there yet okay Okay, cool. 
All right. Yeah. Um, good stuff there. So it's interesting to see so much of that, the, the, the politics and the deals they were making and these um, skirmishes, they're kind of, they can be kind of hard to follow, right? Um, because there's so much of him like telling one nation one thing and this other nation the other thing and these deals being made and like, two facing a lot of things. It's very hard to, to follow. You, you know, if you don't know much, I think about it on Bismarck, that might be something you want to watch again. Um, to try to to try to make sense of it, um, but nevertheless, you just you're continuing to see his his uh, skillful statementship um, as as uh, this is slowly but surely kind of working towards his favor and the goal of of a unified Germany, which of course, as you know, the neighbors are already noticing, um, could be quite a force to to be reckoned with. Um, especially with, you know, he's got these policies, this, you know, iron, you know, believing that the kind of the use of, yeah, iron blood, as they said, to, to achieve things. Um, so he's very, very serious about it for sure. Okay. Well, great. Um, definitely looking forward to finishing up the series. So be sure to look out for the next video, which will cover, um, parts five and six, which should, uh, go ahead and wrap it up and we'll see how he kind of puts a bow on this thing. And, um, uh, yeah, awesome. All right, just a few plugs. Um, we're to be at the beginning of the the video that this video was chosen by the patrons. Um, if you'd like to join our Patreon, uh, go down below. There'll be a link to the description and uh, a pledge to support the channel. Gets you a little bit more involved and a little bit more ability to uh, impact what videos get on this channel there. Um, a couple other invitations. Uh, if you'd like to join a community of um, history buffs and, and fans alike, um, a link to the Discord server is also down below. And um, um, if we see you there, great. If I don't see you there, um, hopefully I'll see you soon with the next video. And we'll go ahead and end it here, and uh, we'll see you soon. Bye.